and this is funny because you you just brought up something which I I sometimes hear on you know CNBC and Bloomberg that you know so many big name companies are trying to break into the Chinese market and that could be a real new source of revenue if they can do that and I think it's just kind of assumed that they can just go over to China and sell their products and really the Chinese government doesn't want that they want to be more self sufficient especially in terms of technology when when we created the World Trade Organization after World War II, we did so on a Ricardian theory of comparative advantage, right? Nations specialize at what they produce best and trade with other countries and other companies they're from in a way that maximizes global economic output, right? Well, in our view, China fundamentally rejects that vision. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we're talking with Stephen Ezel, Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, ITIF has done uh, considerable work on the CHIPS Act and is an advocate for information technology and innovation, specifically in the electronics industry and related industries. And we're very happy to have him on the show. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Zach. Pleasure to be here. So ITIF is probably not a four letter uh, acronym that uh, most folks in the electronics, uh, the electronics industry are aware of. Um, there are other industry advocacy groups that I think are much more familiar. So if you could, uh, please tell us about ITIF and what the organization does. We're a Washington DC based science, technology and economic policy think tank, a uh, 501c3 uh, you know, nonprofit educational foundation. And our mission broadly is to advocate for public policies, laws, and regulations that drive innovation-based economic growth in the United States and in our states and countries around the world. Uh, we have teams inside our foundation uh, who focus on various uh, facets of innovation across vertical sectors of the economy, from biotechnology to clean energy to telecommunications. Uh, it's like a center for data innovation. Um, I personally lead the work we do in advanced manufacturing, advanced technology industries such as semiconductors, quantum computing, high performance computing, and, and life sciences. Uh, but broadly, we try and you know communicate with policymakers, with uh, members of the administration, with the press and the public to you know advance a, a positive view of, of uh, innovation uh, for the benefit of Americans and, and humankind. So I think the next natural question to ask is, how did ITIF recently come to be involved in policy issues relating to the electronics industry, especially in the United States? Well, maybe to tell the story even further back, um, we're located here in Washington where we co-locate co with the Information Technology Industry Council, ITIC. It's kind of a lobbying uh, organization for uh, the US ICT industry. But around 20 years ago, uh, the founder of ITIC wanted to kind of seed formation of a think tank that would elevate the discourse on the importance of information technology to the economy and to society to a higher level. And so uh, they and a few companies at the very beginning got together and, and helped ITIF get off the ground. So working on electronics and, and ICT policy has been uh, core and foundational to our work ever since. And, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, semiconductors, uh, current circuit boards, um, these, are, these are foundational to the entire digital enterprise. Um, they are uh, uh, the brains <laughs> that literally and figuratively power uh, every single electronic device and every downstream application of ICT from, you know, big data to AI. So uh, we have been uh, deeply uh, embedded in this field for for a long time, um, and I should also add that um, I lead with global innovation policy, so I do our global work on these issues, and obviously that enrolls a lot of discussions around um, uh, these technology areas in, in, in China, the rest of Asia, Europe, etc. So kind of this link between uh, global competition for leadership and advanced technology industries has been very important to us. Now, in your backstory of ITIF, you mentioned something important, which is, of course, a recognition that electronics really is the the backbone of all of this other stuff that we enjoy every day. But um, one of the things that I've highlighted 
quite a few times, at least in terms of the, the consumer level or the popular view of the word tech, is that most people totally gloss over the hardware side of it. And they just look at, you know, Facebook and Google and those kinds of companies, and they just think, oh, software, that's tech. Um, is that the same perception that you see when you talk to policymakers? Yeah. Uh, historically, uh, certainly up until the pandemic. Um, okay. You know, uh, <laughs> if you take a TSMC, right, the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, right, it's the, it's the most important company in the world no one knows about, right? Um, but, you know, it goes to, I think, what Arthur C. Clarke said, right, that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right. In, in a way, it's 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 a good thing uh, that uh, these technological systems have evolved uh, so that you can rely on your cell phone or you can rely on your uh, uh, autonomous vehicle or what have you. Uh, but um, it does mean that I think a lot of times uh, people uh, just assume electricity or the plumbing shows up at their house without really kind of understanding all the technology that, that goes into uh, building and sustaining it. I mean, I think that's understandable. It's kind of invisible in the background. You know, unless you're a tinkerer, you've probably never pulled open an old cell phone and realized, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of chips and a circuit board in there. And, uh, you know, another aspect of this, which you may want to get into, um, is the reality that... Uh, you know, our education system uh, produces fewer and fewer, you know, electrical engineers and computer scientists every year. You know, last year, more students in high school in California took uh, pottery than to computer science. Um, so uh, I think one of the challenges we have is uh, if we're not, you know, educating uh, our citizenry, um, you know, I'm not saying everybody's got to go and become an AI programmer or a chip designer. Uh, but there's got to be among our public some, you know, basic understanding of, 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 of you know, engineering and, and, and these technologies, uh, I think, for people to kind of, kind of uh, more appropriately understand and evaluate and, and value them. I, I totally agree with you. And I think this can put us in a position where we get issues like we had during the pandemic. And then, you know, the fortunate outshoot of that was, of course, the Chips and Science Act. Um you guys, uh, as I understand it, were champions of the Chips and Science Act. Um, could you tell us the work that you did on that and um, whether it was, you know, working directly with policymakers or some of the advocacy work? Yeah, um, and, and it's important to understand um, that that we are kind of upstream in the idea value chain in, in Washington, D.C., right? So we, are not, we don't write legislation ourselves. We don't go into congressional offices and lobby for a specific piece of legislation. What we'll do is we'll go in and say, you know, countries like Germany or Taiwan have these uh, applied industrial research institutes like the Fraunhofer Center, and they bring universities and industry together to develop and diffuse technologies throughout industry. The U.S. doesn't have a mechanism like this, so we should create something like the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, right? So we're, we're looking out in the world and seeing, you know, what policy ideas are driving tech and innovation and then, you know, being a, a source of ideas for policymakers in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so you know, with the, the Chips and, and, and Science Act, uh, and uh, your listeners probably know, just to be clear, uh, that what, what that is is really the merging together of two different pieces of legislation. Uh, the Chips Act was being developed under one uh, route uh, through folks like Senator Cornyn, and of course that's the $52 billion we have now to support the U.S. semiconductor sector, uh, $39 billion for uh, incentives and uh, $11 billion for R&D. But separately it was coming the Science Act. Um, this ultimately was $200 billion of authorized uh, funding. Um, and to tell the backstory there, um, I'd actually gone to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and uh, a guy named uh, George Shamba was the uh, chief economic policy advisor for Senator Todd Young of Indiana, um, and uh, reached out to me and said, oh, do, do you know if uh, the senator would like to you know, work with some um, uh, centers on their side of the aisle to develop competitive legislation for the United States. I said, well, you know, I, I know the team in, in, in Schumer's office. You should talk to them. So we actually put Senator Young and Senator Todd Schumer together, and they sat down originally and, and uh, wrote this, this $100 billion Endless Frontiers Act. Um, that was the original piece of legislation that, through various machinations between legislative um, texts passed by House and Congress, became the Bipartisan Innovation Act, and ultimately uh, well, it was all brought together uh, last August in this Chips and Science Act. 
Um, but you know, I, I tie up was was you know, at the ground work of of, of 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 you know laying the congressional groundwork for this. Um, also, there's a number of specific elements within the legislation uh, that we specifically ideated and championed. Uh, for instance, uh, there's uh, was authorized ten billion dollars to build regional technology hubs uh, across the United States. So, um, you know, looking at if you will second tier tech cities, Nashville, Rochester. Salt Lake, right? You know, we, we, we know we have, you know, the, the anchors in Silicon Valley and, and Seattle and San Diego and New York, said, but how do we, how do we get, you know, more, uh, you know, in- inclusive opportunity in the innovation economy across our society? By the way, just briefly, why that matters, we did a study, we looked at where are innovation jobs found in the U.S. economy? We define those as being jobs in companies uh, that invest a certain uh, uh, the, the share of their revenue each year in R&D, so their R&D intensity, and then the number of science, the STEM workers. Essentially, what we found was that one-third of U.S. innovation jobs are found in just 14 U.S. counties and half in just 40 U.S. counties. So that suggests there's a real you know, inequality of innovation opportunity, if you will. So that was an important piece of legislation to kind of, kind of to more, more, more broadly diffuse the, the tech capacity and ecosystem across the United States. Um, yeah, no, so, the, so, the, yeah, we, so we were involved in with, with a lot of the specific programmatic elements that came out of the legislation. And then, of course, uh, we did a number of events ourselves and reports and papers and um, testifying to Congress uh, about the importance of this type of legislation. So um, I, we were, uh, I think, an important uh, champion to help it uh, cross the finish line. So uh, one expression I've heard about legislation is that sometimes it's like sausage. You don't want to know how it's made or you don't want to watch it made. Um, but maybe you'll like the outcome. Um, one thing I'm wondering here about the kind of foundations of this and you know how it all evolved is how does the CHIPS Act compare to industrial policy of other nations? I bring this up because in a, uh, I think last year, or probably the year before, um, I was speaking with uh, General Rob Spaulding, and you know I brought this up to him that um, you know he had mentioned that uh, company or uh, countries like uh, Germany and Japan, you know they have a national industrial policy. And I think for a long time, we didn't really have an industrial policy at the same level or the same robustness that these other nations have. Um, so I'm wondering if the CHIPS Act was a originally intended as a way for us to maybe get on par with those nations or catch up with those nations or mimic what they're doing. Yeah, I think there are a couple elements to that answer. You know, first, you know, on the one key point for your listeners to understand, um, in Congress, there's a difference between authorization and appropriation. So even though Congress has authorized this $200 billion over five years for the science part of it, um, and if you look at that regional tech hub, of which I mentioned, uh, Congress authorized $10 billion for it, but so far has only appropriated a billion dollars for it. So even already, we're seeing a significant gap between the authorizations and the appropriations. Policymakers like to throw out big, huge numbers, but then <laughs> some money really getting delivered. Um, we'll see uh, in budget cycles going forward. But one reason on the, on the science side that was important is because um, federal investment in R&D as a share of GDP has recently declined to lower than it was in 1953, you know, before Sputnik. So, yes, of course, the U.S. does uh, still invest the most in the world uh, for the federal government in R&D. But when you look at the real intensity level of that, right, R&D is a share of GDP in countries like Israel uh, or Korea or Finland, it's going to be in four or five percent. And the U.S. is, you know, around 2.8 percent. So we're ninth among OECD nations in, in R&D intensity. So that's why it's important that we invest more because we need that relative to the size of our economy. Now, coming to your question about industrial policy, right? And of course, this is a very fraught question. What is industrial policy? You know, if you roll the tape back, I don't know if you remember this firm called Quero, uh, but Quero was a firm which was started by the French government from the ground up, funded by the French, to go out and, quote, be the European Google killer. 
it was going to be Europe's uh, answer to Google, right? It was like uh, when France created Group Bull. Uh, it was in the, a, a, a mainframe company in the 1960s to compete against IBM. I don't know, to us at ITIF, industrial policy is one country is annoying specific national champions in certain industries like electronics or steel or shipbuilding or cars. A good example of this, and I, it's important to understand, uh, let's take China. Uh, China has created from the ground up a company called YMTC, Yangtze Memory Technology Corporation. It's a DRAM, a memory chip manufacturer. This is a company started with $25 billion of Chinese government money from the ground up, go compete in global semiconductor memory chip markets. That's really industrial policy. But to us, innovation policy is when we're saying, how can we collaboratively build public-private partnerships like we do with Semitech for the semiconductor sector in the 1980s? That's an important part of this national semiconductor technology uh, consortium that's going to come out of now the chip set. How do we build platforms for collaborative public-private sector R&D? That's very much what the German system with the Fraunhofer's is modeled after. Um, so, but whatever language you want to use to parse this, the, broadly the answer is yes, that the US has not had even a European style of intentional public support for the competitiveness of certain sectors of the economy. Now we did have it, of course, with semiconductors, with Symbatech in the 1980s. Now the great irony, of course, of US semiconductor policy over the past four, four decades um, is, you know, of course, we invented the semiconductor, you know, had 50% of the global market share um, in the 1970s. Japanese competition comes in in the 80s, uh, almost crushes our industry. So we respond uh, effectively with, with like this semiconductor, this, the Semitech Research Consortium. And it actually works. And it actually restores U.S. leadership in the sector during the 1990s. And then we get, wow, we feel good. You know, so we don't need this anymore. So, so we, 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 we let Semitech go by the wayside kind of uh, at least on the manufacturing side, now the business models industry changed, we can talk about that. Um, but ultimately the point for your listeners uh, is that in 1990, the US accounted for 37% of global semiconductor manufacturing. And that share has fallen to 12% today. That's a 70% decline in our share of semiconductor manufacturing. Now, what happened, of course, uh, when you look at the, the broader economics of the semiconductor industry, U.S.-based companies still command 47% of, of market value in the global semiconductor industry. And that's because we have very strong design firms like NVIDIA, AMD, Apple, Qualcomm, and, and there's a tremendous value added from, from designing the chip. But in terms of the manufacture of it, that's largely gone offshore. And today, 92%, the world's most sophisticated semiconductors, those at that sub-7, sub-5 nanometer level are coming um, uh, from, from Taiwan, right? So the intent of the CHIPS Act here um, was to say, um, especially coming off the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and the semiconductor shortages we encountered as a result of that, is to say, if the United States only makes 12% of the world's semiconductors and if 92% of the world's most sophisticated semiconductors are coming off a politically, geopolitically contested island in the South China Sea, uh, for our own national and economic security purposes, um, there's a compelling need to invest in, you know, considerably expanding uh, U.S. semiconductor production activity. One of the uh, criticisms of the CHIPS Act is, I think, is that it's seen as a handout and it is picking winners and losers. And you're really saying that's that's not the case at all. It's really not following the the picking of winners and losers that might happen in might have happened in the past or happen happen overseas. Um, am, I, am I hearing that correctly? I, you know, I, I think I, I contextualize it slightly differently in a couple of ways. Um, you, know, you know, first, the reality is that nations have moved from being price makers to price takers in global marketplaces. And what I mean by that is globalized companies now shop the world and they say, you know, U.S., Israel, England, Germany, Brazil, you know, what do you have to offer us in terms of the best pools of skilled talent, the best digital and physical infrastructure, the best tax policies, the best regulatory regime, how easy is it to do business? You know, semiconductor companies consider over 500 factors when choosing uh, to, to cite a fab, right? So companies uh, or countries uh, and, and states or regions therein you know, are competing fiercely 
to win on all these factors. And it, kind of what's come to take place in this industry over the past several decades, uh, you know, is that hungry nations like Korea or Taiwan will say to these semiconductor firms, you know, um, we'll offset $2 billion of you putting a fab here. And of course, a leading edge fab is now a $20 billion investment. I'll say, well, you know, we'll, we'll offset some of your energy uh, consumption costs, uh, defray your taxes. If you need a road or a rail facility built there, happy to help you out. Um, and so, according to a Boston Consulting Group report, foreign government incentives can reduce the upfront capital expenditures for land construction and equipment in building a fab uh, by up to 15 to 40 percent of the 10 year total cost of ownership of the fab. And the BCG report found that the 10 year total cost of ownership of US based semiconductor fabs is 25 to 50 percent higher than in other locations with government incentives in those countries accounting for 40 to 70% of the US TCO gap. So really what the incentives that the CHIPS Act intends to offer is a mechanism for the US to provide a means to offset those types of incentives that other countries are offering. And, and, and it's critically important to understand this point. So the OECD did a study uh, looking at subsidies in the global semiconductor industry. From uh, 2014 to 2018, they looked at 21 of the world's largest semiconductor companies. What they found was that 86% of the subsidies they could identify went to Chinese firms. And again, this is a key point. What is a subsidy? So in China's case, for firms like SMIC, which is their semiconductor manufacturer, they found that 40% of SMIC's quote unquote revenues were in fact a direct government handout to the bottom line. 40% of SMIC's revenues was government money. That's a subsidy, right? So what we're talking about here is what that means is that the government is capitalizing the firm to enable it to sustain it to compete in global markets in a way that it would not be able to do if it was required to earn a market-based rate of return. That's not what is going on with the US Chips Act. Right, we're not we're not we're not we're not capitalizing Intel, we're not bailing out Intel, Intel like we bailed out General Motors. Right, we're we're providing a pot of money that offsets some of the types of investment incentives that other countries offer, and it's critically important to understand that this is a fundamental and, and, and huge difference. So, you know, is it picking winners, as you say? Well. You know, building, you know, a, a $20 billion fab, um, you know, at most, these companies are going to get maybe 10% of, of that investment. Um, so it, is it enabling? Is it helping? Is it sustaining? Okay, yeah. But um, I wouldn't say that, you know, we're now anointing uh, a U.S. semiconductor champion, right, the way France did with Group Bull. It's also important to recognize that the subsidies or sorry, the, the incentives and grants that are in the CHIPS Act are available to, uh, uh, you know, companies uh, of all corners of the world, uh, so long as they're not been designated foreign adversaries. Um, so it, it, it looks likely uh, once the uh, CHIPS funding starts to flow that, um, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the very first uh, CHIPS funding that was offered was to, was, was to BA Systems. Uh, so a, a European uh, company uh, that has a semiconductor facility that uh, makes some of the parts for the um, F-35 <laughs> fighter was, was one of the first to uh, get the funding. So, you know, I think that's another important difference to understand that this is not just picking U.S. winner companies, but it is uh, to uh, help build uh, a competitive ecosystem uh, for like-minded allied nations to, to be able to uh, compete in this industry. Okay, thanks for clarifying that because this is one of the the criticisms I've seen multiple times within you know my professional network on LinkedIn, and I've seen some uh, posts using the uh, using the term socialist to describe it, and um, I don't know that that's necessarily appropriate. So thank you for that. But one thing, one other thing that I'm wondering here is um, kind of stems from a conversation that I had with Happy Holden on a, on another episode. Um, so he was uh, in the industry during the time when uh, the Chinese and Taiwanese industrial policy was helping them grow their PCB production capacity back in the 1980s. 
And, you know, he br broke it down pretty clearly um, as far as cost comparisons between, you know, building your captive manufacturing operation in, let's say, Virginia versus building it in Taiwan. And, you know, when he put it in those terms, it became pretty clear why it was so attractive and what the momentum was for, for taking all this production capacity overseas. Um, so how does Chips and Science compare to that time period where, you know, the Taiwanese were providing incentives to get uh, companies to, to outsource their production overseas? Were they doing just direct subsidies or were they doing more of a chip sack style innovation management type of approach? You know, it's interesting you, you asked that particular question because we're now working on the study that will uh, make a, a competitive assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the national innovation systems of the U.S. against China, Korea, Taiwan, uh, and Japan. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I mean, there were, you know, you, I mean, go back to Taiwan. I mean, there are a number of, 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 of factors there that were so important to the development of their PCB and, you know, you know, semiconductor sector. Um, you know, uh, of course, uh, there you had uh, a very active uh, set of industrial policies, uh, the support of public research institutes, notably in Taiwan, the Industrial Technology Research Institute, um, which, you know, intentionally was designed by the Taiwanese government to um, uh, find ways to acquire Western technologies. In fact, uh, the start of the Taiwan uh, uh, industry uh, for, for semiconductors was they got a um, uh, license from RCA for CMOS technology. And a lot of that actually came out of U.S. antitrust policy uh, in the 50s and 60s that forced our companies to divulge uh, that uh, intellectual property. So uh, the Taiwanese government essentially would go out, see where they could acquire foreign technology, uh, use that as a base to start their industry, then come along with what you said. Oh, yes, we have a lower cost production environment. Now we can do this. And that um, was 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 instrumental in um, you know in, in, in encouraging uh, the offshoring of a set of U.S. manufacturing to lower cost sectors. I think you know another critical point of this is uh, U.S. companies made very serious mistakes. I mean, Morris Chang, as I have read the history, or to Texas Instruments, of course, Morris Chang, uh, founder of TSMC, uh, came up with a fabulous business model. Right, the idea that uh, most companies heretofore, like ITM. Uh, like TI, Texas Instruments, have been these integrated device manufacturers. You do all of the design, uh, some, uh, fabrication, and um, ATP in-house. And then what he did, of course, was, was broke that um, integrated model by saying, hey, we'll just focus not on design, but solely on the fabrication of the chips. Um, we can protect your IP. Uh, but, you know, Morris took that idea to TI. And the executives at TI turned down that, that, that idea, right? I mean, I mean, the U.S. could have had TSMC, right? So, so. I think the, that that Taiwan has come to lead in the sector. Yes, was a result of of, of uh, effective uh, industrial policies. Uh, it was also uh, kind of a, 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 a fail by some of our businesses to um, um, explore new business models that might have been disruptive to their sector. Um, I, I, but that this this question does come up a lot. Like like, what's different now? How, how can we be certain that the investments we're making now deliver sustained returns and, and we don't go back to the, the old situation we found ourselves in? And, and, and I think it's important to have a, a broader discussion here of the history of U.S. manufacturing. Um, because, and my colleague, our president, Rob Atkinson, actually wrote a book on this called Innovation Economics, the Race for Global Advantage. But really, since the 1990s in Washington, D.C., there has been an attitude that the United States does not need to be manufacturing. We shouldn't be manufacturing. The U.S., in fact, uh, if you remember Lawrence Summers, Lawrence Summers, who uh, was the uh, chair of the economic advisors uh, at the start of the Obama administration, said, quote, America's role in the global economy is to be a provider of ideas and services. It is not to make things. The head of the Peterson Institute for International Economics here in Washington, D.C. was once asked, how much manufacturing uh, should America, does America need to have to remain a high value added, you know, kind of high wage economy? And he said, really, America could lose all of its manufacturing and be just fine. There has quite seriously been an attitude among economists and policymakers in this town that manufacturing does not matter. And that was actually exacerbated, um, in our view, um, 
over the past several years, uh, the, the, I don't you know Clayton Christensen uh, up at Harvard uh, wrote this wonderful book called uh, you know, The Innovator's Dilemma, The Innovator's Solution. But what he points out is that the financialization of the U.S. economy in the 2000s meant that all CEOs were focused on one thing, RONA, return on net assets. If you maximize that RONA, then that allows us to compare the profitability of a bank against uh, the, 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 an airline against a manufacturer, right? So what was the U.S. response in boardrooms across the country? Get rid of your assets. Because if you offshore your assets, you boost, you, you boost your own. So in our view, what I'm trying to say is if it's going to be different now, it's only going to be because economists, CEOs, and policymakers understand that manufacturing matters to sustaining a high wage, high value added U.S. economy, one also capable of defending itself in case of wartime or pandemic. And if we now have this understanding that it matters to invest in these industries, in these sectors, um, then it might be different. But yeah, so what happened? Yeah, we started moving stuff offshore and then agglomeration effects in places like Shenzhen uh, and Taiwan just meant that at some point, uh, because all the component you know, the cabling, the PCB, since it was all made there, the entire local of civil electronics manufacturing uh, shifted from the United States to Asia in about a 20 year period. And our policymakers were with us at the time to do anything about it. You know, everything that you just said, right, you mentioned US, but I think you could remove the word United States and put in Europe. Yeah, and absolutely. I think 99% of what you just said would be equally applicable. Absolutely. No, and, and, and even worse in, in Europe's case. I mean, and yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, hey, you, you're, you, you know, Europe's happy to, to make cars <laughs> and, and maybe some yachts in Italy. Uh, and of course, they have ASML in, uh, in Holland, but uh, <laughs> and Sweden sees it entirely differently than the rest of Europe, to be sure. But yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, England, I mean, um, part, I mentioned our book, um, and our the, the second chapter of our book is about the industrial decline of Britain in the post-World War II era. And it's um, a staggering tale of, I, I want to be clear where, where Italia stands. Uh, our, our view is that the choice is not between all government or no government support for innovation in tech industries. It is what's the right level of support for government innovation. Uh, but I think in the English case, uh, with respect to our British friends, uh, they took laissez-faire approaches to the extreme and um, almost entirely lost all their manufacturing sector. I mean, they have what? They have some, they have some engine manufacturing left um, and uh, uh, a couple of semi firms. But uh, uh, our book talked that it was like the biggest uh, industrial decline for any nation in, in known history. Wow, the UK. That, I, I had I had no idea about that, but um, I'm going to have to read about that. Um, so I think that begs the question, uh, you know, now that we've done this in the U.S., um, should the EU or individual European nations implement similar approaches? You know, not the the approach of France where they're trying to you know pick winners and losers, but you know, really an innovation management kind of approach that that is uh, enshrined in the Chips and Science Act. Yeah, no, they should and they are. Um, uh, Germany's spending twenty billion dollars forward for its semiconductor sector, uh, and the EU actually has its own European Chips Act. That's what they called it. Uh, Forty-seven billion dollars. Uh, that they have put forward, uh, again, a mix of R&D and um, uh, incentives to attract their manufacturers. Uh, we actually uh, released a report called An Allied Approach to Semiconductor Competitiveness, um, you know, which tries to make the case that uh, uh, w to ensure that these policies don't lead to uh, overcapacity uh, or, you know, a, 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 an uncoordinated glut of investment, um, you know, like-minded countries should be collaborating to some degree uh, to, you know, invest in, you know, R&D efforts uh, for kind of the, you know, what comes beyond Moore's Law uh, type of uh, approaches. Um, we should be coordinating uh, amongst ourselves uh, to ensure that, I don't know, I've 
there, there's a saying uh, that exists um, with like export credit, and it's a deal now between Airbus and Boeing about how they will handle export credit financing. It's called the the, the OECD aircraft understanding. So you know some ideas like that for how we can ensure that the competition we want to have in this sector uh, unfolds not in a protectionist way, but um, in, in you know in a market based way. Yeah, I think that's another danger of these types of policies is that you start to to see protectionist policies start to arise and then you get tariff wars and and things like that that we saw, you know, about 8 years ago. And um and I'm we wondering see it right, now. If... right. So, you look at all the 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 back and forth between US and Europe over the, the solar panels and the electric batteries and electric, or electric vehicle aspects of the IRA. Yeah, that's gotten very much protectionist that you know, the incentives are only available to manufacturers if they're here in the country. Um, yeah, yes, uh, it's very important that uh, competition in the semiconductor sector does not go the route as it's evolved in the clean energy sector. Yeah, I, I see kind of a danger here because if if you uh, don't have enough capacity locally, but then you have these protectionist measures, it forces you to procure offshore, and then you've really done nothing to reduce costs. In fact, all you've done is increase costs for companies who are trying to produce end products. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about semiconductors, but um, without a printed circuit board, the semiconductors are kind of meaningless. And the differential between overseas production in Asia, specifically in the Chinese market share, versus production in the US and Europe is massive. You could drive a semi truck through it. So I think that begs the question, would a PCBs act succeed in creating the same kind of results that we want to see with the Chips and Science Act? Can we take an innovation management approach with PCB manufacturing, or is PCB manufacturing just such a race to the bottom on price that a different approach is needed to try and geographically diversify that part of the supply chain? Yeah, I mean, my view is that we can and we should. I mean, when we talked about semiconductor manufacturing, we said the U.S. share fell from 37% to 12%. If the Chips Act is a wonderful success, well, maybe we'll get it back up to 20%, right? So in a like manner, when you look at the U.S. share of PCB production, uh, that was about 25% in 2000, and it's fallen just 4% today. It's um, over 9% decline. Um, China manufactures 56% of the world's PCBs now. Between China and Taiwan, that's up to 70%. rest of Asia is, you know, over in the 90s. Um, so, yes, we have in that... In, in PCB is a, a massive dependence on Asian production uh, today as well. Uh, and this is why uh, the U.S. industry, the Print Circuit Board Association of America, has worked with uh, several of Congress members, uh, including uh, Blake Moore of Utah and Anna Eshoo uh, of California, to uh, advance this Protecting Circuit Boards and Substrates Act, uh, which, much like the CHIPS Act, would provide a 25% tax credit for the purchase or acquisition of American-made Printed circuit boards and uh, offer um, three billion dollars um, in, in uh, incentives for a financial assistance pro program uh, for uh, uh, companies or facilities manufacturing or um, doing research on PCBs. I think uh, we absolutely need this as well. Um, as Travis Kelly and David Shield of the PCBA say, uh, the semiconductors don't float; <laughs> they need to be on a, a, a substrate and then on a printed circuit board. Uh, that. PCB needs to be secure, uh, just like the semiconductor itself does. And um, when you're only manufacturing 4% of, of the world supply, and, and then only for mostly for very specific defense purposes, uh, yeah, I think that introduces a national security vulnerability uh, and economic dependence that uh, US policymakers would be wise to address as well. Yeah, I think uh, one of the big uh criticisms of just reshore everything that comes up and really gets applied hard to PCB production is, well, do you want to pay $1,000 for your toaster oven? And um, it's because I think a lot of products uh, that use PCBs really are price sensitive. I mean, there's not sensitive IP, it's not being used for, uh, you know, defense purposes or anything like that. Um, you know, you don't have a lot of advanced components in it, so it kind of could be manufactured really anywhere. And you're not in danger. You're not putting yourself in any economic danger until you geographically concentrate everything in one place, and then natural disaster, geopolitical, you know, pandemic, whatever, creates that supply chain risk. So, 
if we can't do it all in the U.S. due to such extreme price sensitivity, is it appropriate to implement some kind of innovation management or industrial policy that takes it to friendshoring? So let's say, you know, Latin America, Canada, something like that. Yeah, um, we, my organization, uh, released a report uh, last week uh, assessing how one country in Latin America, the Dominican Republic, uh, could assume a greater role in uh, PCP or some microdiversity test and packaging value chains. Um, yeah, I think there's substantial uh, opportunity to uh, bring this type of production back to like-minded uh, hemispheric uh, countries in the Americas. I think. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at the Dominican Republic, their uh, hourly manufacturing cost is uh, just six percent that of the United States. Right, so um, that's why uh, they actually have a very robust electronics manufacturing industry down there. Uh, mostly, it's circuit breakers and junction boxes. Um, but could a country like that do they have the the base of skills and electronics manufacturing know how to make the jump up the value chain into PCBs? Yeah, I think they could. You know, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica are obviously getting in the space as well. Mexico um, does a fair amount. I, I don't know the percentage, but um, I know that they do a lot of the, the PCB uh, baseboard manufacturing for like Rockwell Automation and Eaton Corporation and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, no, but this is a critical point um, that, uh, like with some of my nerves, it doesn't all, all ha have to come back to the United States. Um, but I think it's a win if some more share of it does come back to the United States. Can we get that back to 10%? Can we get it back to half of what it was at the start of this millennium? Uh, and then can we get more of it going to uh, the, the friendly um, near short places um, across the world? By the way, this, this leads me to um, uh, <laughs> another point that I, I like to make. Our, our view is that China's economic strategy has fundamentally, fundamentally evolved uh, since the 1980s along the following trajectory. Initially, it started with an attraction strategy. Ding Xiaoping, come manufacture here, far lower labor cost environment, lot sizes of a million. So that was the attraction was largely the Chinese strategy up until Xi Jinping comes into office. And around the mid 20, uh, 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 in the mid 2010s, um, it turns to, to much more of what we call a compulsion economic strategy. Okay, you have to manufacture here if you want to sell to our market. You have to transfer IP or technology if you want to sell to the market, or what, what China called trading uh, a market for technology. We argue that it's now evolved to an expulsion strategy. So if China has a domestic competitor that can suffice for the local market, the foreign enterprises are no longer invited to service that marketplace. So we see this. There was an initiative called DIOE. This was a called this was D Intel Oracle and uh, uh, EMC, and the Chinese government will literally went around to all the SOEs and said, "You're getting these companies' products out of out of your business, right?" So here's the situation we encounter right now: thirty six percent of U.S. semiconductor industry sales go to China. Now, this is why when we debate issues like export controls in Washington, D.C., the industry probably says, well, you know, if you don't let us sell to China, uh, then we can't earn revenues that we need to reinvest in future generations of innovation. That's exactly right. But here's the conundrum. China wants your share to be zero. If China could wave a wand and have its way with its uh, trillion dollars it's invested in the semiconductor sector over the past decade, you wouldn't sell anything in China. So how do we deal with that economic game board? And the only answer is that we intentionally design a world where in a decade, our semiconductor companies say, only 15% of our sales have to go to China. Why and how? Well, because we're making the world's laptops and servers and mobile phones in friendly places like India or South America, that the U.S. policymakers intentionally re-architect the global economic game board in advanced industries in our economic favor. That's what policymakers in Washington should be doing. And if we can do that, then we can help our own companies get out of the box that they find themselves in of needing to sell a third of their products to a country that wants nothing more for their product sales to be 0%. Interesting conundrum because, um, it, it, and this is funny because you, you just brought up something which I, I sometimes hear on you know CNBC and Bloomberg that you know 
so many big name companies are trying to break into the Chinese market. And that could be a real new source of revenue if they can do that. And I think it's just kind of assumed that they can just go over to China and sell their products. And really, the Chinese government doesn't want that. They want to be more self-sufficient, especially in terms of technology. When, when we created the World Trade Organization after World War II, we did so on a Ricardian theory of comparative advantage. Right. Nations specialize at what they produce best and trade with other countries and other companies they're from in a way that maximizes global economic output. Right. Well, in our view, China fundamentally rejects that vision. So in theory, China should be totally happy with making PCBs or Chotskis or what have you and trading for a Boeing aircraft, for instance. Right. But China doesn't accept that. China wants absolute advantage in all advanced technology industries, right? They want to lead in high-speed rail, in semiconductors, in solar panels, and networking equipment, right? Um, and, and of course, more broadly, what they want is uh, unfettered access to global markets while the ability to control their own and be autarkic and monopsonistic in their own market. So this is a vision of, of economic trade craft. I mean, I mean, this, is, this is like what, there's a term for this is called power trade. It's what actually the Germans practiced in, in, in kind of 1910s and 1920s. Um, but in our view, we're dealing with the competitor that fundamentally rejects the structure of the global economy that the United States and other countries stood up uh, in the post-war era. And you know we need to be wise to the fact that China is playing an entirely different game than we are. And it's had um, a massive impact, and yeah, you know, um, well, <laughs> it's a good reason. With, with PCBs, is just one example of the industry of how they've come to claim 56 percent of the market share, where they had virtually nothing, you know, forty years ago. Look at, look, but by the way, look at uh, just uh, solar panels. In um, two thousand eight, China made six percent of the world's solar panels. By twenty eighteen, they made over seventy percent. Complete change, um, and it's because wow. they use policies like uh, massive industrial subsidization um, to um, you know kind of build these industries from the ground up and dump uh, products in global marketplaces on, on non-market based terms. Our response in these types of industries needs to be needs to be wise to these dynamics uh, because in our view at least at ITIF uh, that's the the nature of, of the way the game is being played uh, in the global economy and yeah, if we want to do things like get more semiconductor, more PCB manufacturing back here, you know, we just got to be wise to the dynamics of the global marketplaces in which these sectors compete. Sure, I understand. And, and I guess the, the end goal here is not to say, well, you know, they can't manufacture anything. It's, it's more to say, well, you know, we want some more market share. And I think ultimately this benefits everybody, whether you're, you know, a small startup company trying to, to scale or whether you're a large OEM. Because now you have much greater access to the to the components and and materials that you need to build your products and serve your customers. Yeah, and to be clear, just, and we want nothing more than for China to fully comply with its WTO commitments and conduct its trade and economic affairs in a way that uh, it's committed to it would uh, for its partners. Because you know nations agreed that that would be the best way to maximize global warfare. Uh, but if that's not going to be the case, then we got to be wise that. It has an effect on our industries and our, our workforce and, uh, you know, compete accordingly. Well, this is all so interesting, and it's it's certainly an area that uh, I probably need to do some more reading on so I can uh, learn more about all of this. But um, I want to just say thank you so much for joining us uh, to talk about all this stuff. Um, of course, very relevant in the post-COVID era, and I'm sure going to continue to be relevant going forward in the near future. Zach, thank, thanks so much for the invitation. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Uh, to everyone that's out there listening, we've been talking with Stephen Ezel, Vice President of Global Innovation Policy from the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. You'll be able to keep up with all of our podcast tutorials and episodes as they come out. And last but not least, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>